Welcome everyone to On the Park Bench. We'll be getting started shortly. We're gonna wait for folks to enter the webinar first. So give us just a few minutes and we'll get going. All right, it looks like people are starting to join. We're gonna get started in just a minute. Just give us a couple more, a couple more attendees entering in. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is On the Park Bench, a public square conversation. My name is Mallory Batches. I'm the Director of Strategic Development for Congress for the New Urbanism. And today's webinar is entitled CNU 29, Design for Physical Change. Uh, on the Park Bench, a public square conversation is brought to you by the, Con the Congress for the New Urbanism. It presents interactive conversations that thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries can provide an opportunity for audience engagement in real time. The webinar series is intended to be a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on the pressing and emerging issues we're all facing right now. And so please reach out to us if there are topics you'd like to hear about or speakers you would like to see on this platform. Like I said, today's conversation is CNU 29, Design for Physical Change. And I'm joined by Nathan Norris, Camille Cortez, and Frank Starkey. And this webinar today will be moderated by Garland Woodson. Whoops, let's see, there, whoops, there we go. Uh, the, the webinar topic today describes one of the three tracks of our upcoming Congress, CNU 29 Design for Change. Uh, this will be our last virtual Congress, good news, uh, and we'll be offering five days of programming around the new and ongoing issues that cities face in these extraordinary times of change. The registration rates for CNU 29 are the lowest they've ever been. And you'll be able to collect professional continuing ed credits, as you always can. And you'll have access to the session archives for six months afterwards. So we encourage you to register for this incredible opportunity to connect, to learn, and to share. And I really look forward to seeing everyone at CNU 29, May 17th through 21st. I also wanna let you know about upcoming webinars that we have on the On the Park Bench series. On Tuesday, May 4th, next week, we'll have the Authors Forum again. And this time we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of Life Between Buildings with Jan Gale, the, and, you know, for many of us new urbanists, an instrumental uh, book that taught us so much about the social interactions that we see in the public realm. And then Tuesday, May 11th, we'll have our final in this series of, of anticipatory webinars ahead of the Congress with CNU 29 Design for Social Change. That'll be moderated by Todd Zimmerman with Karen Parolik, Marquez King, and Jennifer Hurley as panelists. And uh, as I said, these sessions are intended to give you an idea of what conversations and what uh, topics are going to be discussed at CNU 29 in our upcoming Congress. If you saw last week's webinar, you heard um, uh, our panelists discuss the urgent need for policy change, to design for policy change, and, and why that's, these are critical topics that affect the work of new urbanists. And today we're going to talk about the critical need to design for physical change. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And with this, I'm gonna turn this over to Garland Woodsong, your moderator for today, and uh, enjoy the conversation, everyone. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, and before I introduce our speakers, um, I just wanted to give a little more of a, um, a sneak tease of, uh, of this year's CNU's uh, physical track. Uh, and so I'm gonna uh, run a little poll here and, uh, and please enter your answers into the chat. Um, and so the poll is, which of these is a real physical track session title at CNU this year? Is the answer number one, climate change 101, preparing for mass relocation? Is it number two, small developers and cute design? Is it number three, 
Urban Design 101, How to Design Buildings, Cities, Regions, and Neighborhoods People Love. Is it number four, International, European, Latin America, Antarctica, and beyond? Or is it number five, United Streets of America, post-pandemic 15-minute city, interweaving green space, tactical placemaking, and the remix, walkable suburban missing middle housing. You can pick your uh, your choice and, uh, and place it in, in the chat. Uh, and with that, I am going to introduce our speakers. Um, so first we have um, Camille Cortez, who is a... Uh, urban designer with uh, DPZ and a co-founder of uh, the Place Initiative. Uh, next up after Camille, we'll have Nathan Norris, who's a recovering attorney and a leader with City Building Partnership at LC, followed by Frank Starkey, who's a real estate developer and architect with People Places LLC. Camille, take it away. Thanks, Darlin. One sec, please share my screen. All right. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. While there are plenty of organizations working on climate change, very few of them recognize the role that urban design and growth management play in reducing emissions and adapting to migrating climate and population. Place Initiative, a group recently born from CNU this past year, hopes to make this a priority. We are looking to establish partnerships and grow leadership around changes in policy, design, and advocacy to achieve people-centric solutions to the climate-driven challenges of our future. CNU and its members have an essential role to play in addressing climate change. CNU's strategic plan addresses this directly, quote, CNU will continue to address the relationship between the built environment and climate impact to achieve more resilient places and regions, mitigating future climate risk and adapting to changing climate conditions. Working co collabor collaboratively with state and local governments, we will further advance existing new urbanist strategies that not only ensure survival, but a rich quality of life. CNU is uniquely positioned to deliver new urbanist principles as a strategy for addressing climate change vulnerabilities. We all know that climate change is a looming issue and as a movement, we have not recently addressed it head on. The strategic plan provides a foundation to work from, but the movement is led by its members. We must be the change we want to see, tapping into CNU's broad body of knowledge to ground rapidly progressing policy decisions in a framework influenced by the charter. Design and urbanism are critical components in climate policy. Physical change cannot occur without the policy change, which is why policy reform has been a big focus for place initiative. In what form is growth permitted? And does that contribute to future resilience and reduction in greenhouse gas emissions? Where should growth occur within a region? How can disinvested cities benefit from climate migration? These questions are relevant while analyzing current design strategies and policy. CNU has long advocated for change to support a resilient future, but is it alone? Luckily, CNU is not alone. Other global organizations have built upon our framework and have connected to, to it with their own local and regional concerns and considerations. Despite some members' hard work, we are not yet in lockstep with our allies. One of our greatest allies is the United Nations and their, their new urban agenda, which parallels our own charter. Place Initiative hopes to connect the charter and the new urban agenda along with CNU members who have been hard at work in this arena. Implementing the new urban agenda is an enormous unmet challenge in many ways. Similarly, the charter is an unmet challenge that we frequently re return to, finding it continues to serve as an unassailable goal. Yet, there is a power in this new global agreement pushing a new paradigm for urban development centered around human beings and the public spaces where they interact. This is why Place Initiative is partnering with the World Urban Campaign, a program of the UN Habitat and CNU to host a virtual urban thinkers campus, also known as UTC. From the UN standpoint, we can develop ideas to contribute towards an updated new urban agenda strategy that focuses more specifically on the role of urbanism in reducing demand for energy while building more equitable, resilient human communities. 
From the CNU standpoint, we can develop bottom up and top down strategies to rapidly increase our image and begin implementing changes yesterday. Our events core days will take place Monday and Tuesday, the week of CNU, and will focus on discussions of urbanism's role in climate response and physical design, including tools and strategies incorporating resiliency and adaptation, transportation, natural and working lands, and socially equitable development. We aim to bring new voices to the movement and to expand on climate innovation. The event is an inclusive opportunity to share, learn, and innovate. The result will be an action plan to tackle our world's biggest issues our way. We sought this partnership since the World Urban Campaign is a coalition focused on urban change in order to achieve sustainable places. Their mission is to contribute by developing solutions and to take direct action in cities, implementing the new urban agenda to accelerate sustainable development goals by 2030. The UTC is conceived as an open space for critical exchange between urban researchers, professionals, and decision makers who believe that urbanization is an opportunity to drive positive future impact. It is also intended as a platform to build consensus between partners and a means of proposing shared solutions to our climate future. Through Place Initiative's UTC event, we are seeking broad solutions yet are focused on barriers to change here in the US, such as core, core code reform efforts. We now have essentially the adoption of the charter of the new urbanism by many other names at a global scale. But about implementation, we need to increase, increase tool sharing. Some of this will proceed at, at the level of governments. But as we know at CNU, bottom-up change is key to growing a culture of change professionally and informally. CNU's focus has been on research into practice, but what do we know about improving public spaces and how to even protect them against erosion or destruction, which is happening in too many places? How can we share this knowledge? What are the tools that can be used locally? And how can we accelerate the tools developed by new urbanists and collaborators be ad adapted and made more suitable to other contexts outside of the US? How about various form-based codes, new street design standards, financial tools, scenario modeling tools, and design models? There are new urbanists working effectively overseas, but you would hardly know it by the discussions at the Congresses, as it is too often the case with other organizations. So bringing a UTC into the CNU will allow for more engagement to occur, eyes to be open, and collaboration for a common cause to occur. CNU is on the right track leading with ideas, research, and practical tools, but unless we're in the venues where we can share, our efforts will have very limited impact. Our goal is to get as many people into the UTC as possible from as wide a setback a set of backgrounds as we can. We are actively looking for proposals for a quick five minute lightning, lightning presentations and anyone is welcome to submit an idea, proposal, work sample or other innovation that may help to advance change at the intersection of climate equity and urbanism. If you'd like to learn more about Place Initiative's shoulder event and are interested in registering and participating, please visit, visit the events tab on our website, placeinitiative.org. It will be free and open to all who register. Thank you on the park bench for having me today. I look forward to seeing audience folks at the shoulder event. Thanks. Thank you, Camille. And uh, I've placed the link in the chat to uh, register for that uh, event, uh, the Place Initiative Climate Summit and to uh, propose to, to speak there. Uh, before we move on, uh, so the answer to the, uh, the initial question um, is boringly um, just number one, climate change 101, preparing for mass relocation. We will have to get into the remix of walkable suburban missing middle housing at a later date, because uh, that was actually a mashup of about 10 different session titles <laughs> that you can look forward to at the, this year's Congress. Um, so without further ado, uh, Nathan, take it away. Sure, thanks, Garland. Uh, I'm not gonna be as polished as Camille, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview of uh, how the, uh, the Urban Guild, who is uh, putting together seven different sessions in collaboration with the CNU, um, has broken these down into three different categories that might interest you, or more importantly, uh, be of interest to people who you may know that should be participating in uh, some of these sessions. These sessions, the first group is essentially what I would call sort of 101 level uh, uh, instruction on building design, urban design, and illustration. And as we know, in too many places, we still don't have very good design. So whether it's uh, politicians, planning commissioners, um, local planners or designers, 
there's always an opportunity for people to really benefit from the one-on-one offerings that we have. So we're gonna, once again, do the how to design buildings people love session with Steve Muzon leading the way this year with Lauren Kelly, as well as Gian Lloyd Pena Redondo, um, who will be uh, critiquing that session as they, we always have somebody critiquing these sessions. And that's a very, very awesome sort of overview of how people should approach design of buildings from a, 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 from, from a big picture perspective and then get down into the details. So it's really good for people who really don't know where the beginning or the end is of good design. And so it's gonna explain it in lay person's terms, um, how to approach it. On the urban design, that's sort of the same thing. Jeff Dyer will be leading that session. Fortunately, we'll have Mallory Botches on that as well. Um, and that's gonna be how to design cities and neighborhoods people love with the emphasis also on the region. And that's gonna be again, once again, for a, a group that uh, may not have high literacy as it relates to all the principles of new urbanism or how people go about within the new urbanism designing places that people will love. This is sort of giving a very uh, broad understanding of how that, that uh, happens and then gets into some of the details having to do with things like block design and the like. The third key uh, uh, session that's made for that really one-on-one group which uh, may or may not be you, is that uh, how do we illustrate the built environment? Why do we do that? I talk about it as the most important aspect of planning is are the, the eye candy that gets generated. And today, because of computers, there's so much more to what is possible. And not only is what is possible to illustrate plans, but to actually help inform the planning process during the planning process. So those three se uh, sessions are all built about that. We have another segment, which is for all, all the advanced folks. You know, people like Frank Starkey, who so has been around this for decades. He just, you know, he's he may not need to sit in on an hour long session on suburban retrofit. Instead, what he needs is Ellen Dunham Jones to come in and for ten minutes tell him what he may have missed over the last year. And so we have what we call the urban design update sessions, and there's two of those. One will be uh, 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 you know, covering affordable housing with Megan O'Hara, uh, post-COVID planning with Andres, uh, suburban retrofit with Alan Dunham Jones. Matt Lambert will be talking about streetscape design, and then we'll have Andrew Von Morrow on architecture. So that's just 10 minute snippets of what you might have missed in the last year on these topics, as opposed to a deep dive. The, the second group is equally compelling. We've got John Anderson talking about incremental development. You've got Michael Iden on tactical urbanism, Bob Gibbs on retail, which is a, you know, he's going to be pressed for only talking about changes in retail in 10 minutes over this past year. But then we have Eliza Harris Giuliano on transportation design, Jennifer Hurley on public engagement, and then the irrepressible Howard and Blacks in the third talking about civic space design. So those are sort of the, the quick updates for the more advanced crowd. And then I think the two interesting sessions that are a little different that I hope to see carried on as we move forward in subsequent Congresses. One is gonna be for the incremental development crowd. As, as many people know, um, there's a large, large, large uh, number of people who are just interested in small scale incremental development. And so this year, Ashley Walton, Ali Thurman Quinlan, and Gian uh, Lloyd uh, uh, Pena Redondo are gonna talk about how to avoid the common uh, mistakes with incremental development design, specifically focusing on proportion issues, massing issues, things of that nature, where we see a lot of missed opportunities. So that's going to be more of a hands-on thing, but really geared toward the incremental development group. Um, and if you know some people in your uh, community who could benefit from that, that'd be a good one. The one that I personally am sort of looking forward to because of the lack of knowledge amongst really the new urbanists about these projects or they haven't been to them yet are two really innovative, what I call third generation traditional neighborhood developments. And this is a focus on what is the next generation of buyer uh, in the form of the millennial and the Gen Z, and how does that impact building type, building styles, the planning, et cetera. And so we're gonna have Rob Parker and Lou Oliver talk about the Trillith project, which is in South Atlanta, um, also known as Pinewood Forest previously. And then we're going to have Blair Humphreys and Sam Day talk about the Wheeler District. And Angie Figueroa from Beachtown 
in Galveston, Texas, which is a DPZ project there. She's going to be actually a Generation Z person who's going to critique what the old folks are talking about. So that's going to be a pretty good session because if you haven't seen the, the building types and the, the, the stylistic uh, approaches they're taking on, on those two projects, then you're really missing out. So uh, without further ado, Frank, you ready to talk about your stuff? Sure, I'll talk about what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I'm, pinch, I'm pinch hitting here, so I don't have the inside track on the content that's coming up in the Congress, but I think Nathan just gave a really good rundown of that and uh and camille of course is talking about a fantastic shoulder event that's happening right before which i encourage everybody to attend i'm looking forward to participating in part of that myself i wanted to talk from the perspective of somebody who works every day in in um building things uh in uh, in the new urbanism world i cut my teeth to developing a legacy um tnd for, um, starting in the late 90s called longleaf and in the last five or six years, I've been working on infill, full fill, refill development um, in Newport Ritchie, Florida. I'm extremely focused in one particular town that's a pre-war town that has all the great urban bones but hasn't been um, rediscovered yet. And we're um, working hard to, to rediscover it and, and um, fulfill the promise of the original plan, uh, which is pretty great, but was never really built out. But that taps into a whole lot of, of questions and, and issues and matters that are important to new urbanists that we need things like the Congress annually to get together and discuss. Questions about gentrification, questions about equity, and how do, how do we increase the participation of the members of the community who exist in forming the next phase or the next stage of life of their community, uh, as opposed to outside developers coming in with uh, big expense accounts and big pro formas and big um, exotic capital uh, to develop places. So I'm looking forward to continuing as, as, as always happens at the Congress, uh, great conversations with brilliant people about uh, and, and thoughtful people who are working in a lot of different and interesting places on different questions and, and to to get uh, to hone my skills and and uh, sharpen my perspective on what I can be doing in my own work as a developer and as a, an architect in a, in a one particular town in one particular state in the country. Um, that's I, I don't know that I have a whole lot more to, to add than that, um, but I, uh, if there are any questions or uh, uh, Nathan and Camille and Garland have comments to add. I think that would be a good place to go from here. Cool. Well, thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. Um, and going back to my introductory question uh, and my response, I didn't mean to imply that Climate Change 101 preparing for mass relocation would be a boring session. Au contraire, that's going to be in my top five sessions to catch this year. Uh, it's just that the title of that session maybe perhaps was not as uh, titillating as, uh, as the title of session number five. Um, so uh, I'm going to dive into some provocative questions uh, for our distinguished panel. Uh, so, and, and, uh, and so let me just dive right in. Uh, question number one, uh, what sorts of climate tests should all new projects be subject to? And what I mean is, as professionals, we have the opportunity to lead by example. Even if we can't convince regulating jurisdictions to adopt forward thinking policy that includes climate tests soon enough to be relevant, uh, we might instead seek to ask and answer for every project we work on questions such as, will this project result, result in a net increase or decrease in greenhouse gas emissions uh, per capita or in total uh, compared to what? Compared to a 1990 or 2005 baseline uh, for where? For the jurisdiction that it falls within? Um, how might the design for this project need to change to ensure that it will be uh, adaptable and resilient uh, to any potential changes and hazards that it may face over the coming century? Will it survive 10 feet of sea level rise? Will it survive uh, wildfire hazards? Will it survive increased flooding? Will it provide homes and businesses for climate refugees? 
how does this project help to provide access to the lowest rungs on the economic ladder and economic opportunity for those who need it most? Or how does this project increase access to housing affordable for those who most need it? Uh, so I'm seeding these as possible questions and uh, I'd like to hear from you. Um, do you think the, that we as professionals have a role in articulating these climate tests and subjecting our own projects that we work on, whether it be for ourselves or for clients um, to them as we seek to make the case for the projects and build them out? I'll, I'll dive in on that real quick. Uh, the, um, the, the, the environmental performance of and, and the re environmental benefits of new urbanism or urbanism have always been primarily implicit in what we don't do um, rather than explicit in, in what we do build. Um, the way that LEED is explicit about um, the environmental benefits of the materials, of the material chain of custody, for example, of where, that, where the lumber comes from and um, you know, tracing it back to the original forest. Um, it's very explicit, but sometimes, as we know, can result in um, green buildings in ungreen locations, whereas urbanism creates locations that are that are green in their performance just by their by their um, over by their uh, a more holistic view of the interactions between commercial uses and residential, for example, and transportation being minimized, et cetera. So the, I think that a, a challenge for new urbanism is to make its um, performances relative to climate subjects as well as just local environmental um, impacts, local and regional environmental impacts, to make those performances more explicitly understandable and measurable in order to be able to answer the kind of questions that you're raising. But um, for a lot, for, you know, we've generally kind of let it go, not unsaid, but unmeasured and un, unemphasized that what we're building is implicitly green. I mean, we, we, you know, we know, for example, that the average Manhattan resident uses dramatically less um, resource inputs than the typical suburban resident. Um, but that's a, that's a rare statistic that gets at what we all sort of know intuitively or implicitly from what we do. So I think we need to be become more measured um, without becoming overly regulatory because that that can um, frustrate um, the, the box checking um, is what um, has led to suburbanization in, in a large degree. So um, that's so I think becoming more explicit about how urbanism benefits um, and has um, has impacts that are that are beneficial in the equation on climate is helpful is is necessary and it also is necessary so that we can see where it comes up short or where it doesn't address things that need to be added into the equation. So I, I heard this stuff is important, but let's not distill it all the way down to um, the level of box checking because um, box checking is sort of what got us into this mess and we need to still leave room for creative thinking and creative solutions to these problems. Yeah. That... Nathan? I would offer one box and it would be block size and then I wouldn't worry about anything else. If we can just get small block size, then you know I don't think that's too onerous necessarily. Um, but if if you were to you know if you were to impose some sort of regulation, that would be my regulation. It would be um, you know one sentence on one page that's otherwise blank that just is block size. What's your ideal block size, Nathan? Well, it obviously varies upon your context. But uh, I'm generally a fan of the, the, you know, when you're in the 300s and 400s, once you get out of that, then I get unhappy. And if you get smaller than that, then I get unhappy. So um, I'm not moving to Portland soon, but, you know, no offense to it. But, you know, give me, give me three, 300s and 400s and I'm happy. By, by 200, right? You like a rectangle, not a square? 
Uh, yeah, I do prefer rectangles, but no, I want more than two and I want it, you know, uh, I, although I'm not opposed, you know, once again, in the context, I'm not opposed to, if you give me 330 by 330 or something, I can, I can make that work. But uh, just in the, we just need to get in the general ballpark. I would not want to be on my box saying that it must be this. I'd say it's a range and I could go, let, let's just say uh, 200 to 450. Generally happy with that if, if all the blocks are that size. And that would go further than probably anything else, um, even though that doesn't complete, uh, it, that doesn't create a fantastic neighborhood on its own. It just creates the opportunity for it to redevelop into a great neighborhood after the first person screwed it up. Okay, so we heard from Frank. Um, don't don't distill this down to too many checkboxes. Leave room for creativity. We heard from Nathan. Just one checkbox, please. Make it a block size. Camille, what's your reaction to uh, climate and equity tests for for our professional projects? Um, well, I think I mean I think that policy has a lot to do with it. And you know, I'm not a builder or developer. I, I work you know for an urban design company that deals with a lot of these issues. But I feel like you know you have to target the root cause, which is in, in code reform and, you know, in jurisdictions. And, you know, I think that can influence what we're able to accomplish to have more equitable development and, you know, providing places in downtown for climate refugees. I mean, we're seeing that a lot here in Portland and how, um, you know, Port Portland is, is really handling the homeless, homeless population and, and trying to, you know, make spaces like, through, through small like tactical projects, like, uh, you know, uh, like the homeless villages that are coming up now. So I, I think that a lot of, I, I think that as, as builders, we need to, you know, find the loopholes that will allow for, for those types of developments to be, to be built and, and really advocate and push uh, against uh, local, uh, uh, local city policies to, to allow for that to be easier to build. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I see a mix of, of different perspectives on this policy and, uh, and I see that we're gonna have a very um, interesting uh, set of conversations, both at the Place Initiative Climate Summit and at CNU this year around these topics. Um, so next, I'm going to run through a list of ideas that might help to open up new opportunities for climate response, housing availability, and economic opportunity. And we can discuss each one uh, off the cuff uh, until we run out of time. So the first uh, idea I'm going to toss out to our distinguished panel is the idea of accessory commercial units. Um, so for decades, we've, we've heard of uh, accessory dwelling units, um, which is when you have a, a primary residence, you have an accessory uh, residents either um, built into that space in the basement or in the attic or in an in annex or in a separate building. Um, but what if uh, accessory commercial units were a thing? What if you could have a commercial use uh, in what was formerly a, a, a solely residential use neighborhood? Um, and, and as we know, uh, the concept of zoning and creating um, solely residential neighborhoods was enacted um, during World War II and after World War II, partly uh, as a form of economic segregation uh, to enact racial segregation in this country when racial segregation was uh, outlawed uh, through the, uh, explicitly. Um, so accessory commercial units, um, pros, cons, is this a way to in introduce economic diversity into our neighborhoods or is it just one way to provoke the NIMBYs? It'll certainly provoke the NIMBYs, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'd I, I, it's what I like about it is that it returns a true free market um, sensibility to the street level and to the to the urban fabric, which is as you pointed out is was artificially dist it, um, distorted out of our urban mix for a long time, and it you know will obviously favor some locations, some parcels and some locations that have higher traffic, for example, than others, but it also helps uh, create a, a way to it, take advantage of that higher traffic and also to mitigate the impacts of that higher traffic on the, on the residents, on the residential um, living 
in those neighborhoods. So I, I think it's a, a, a necessarily normal thing that should be permitted in regular neighborhoods. Um, and it's and it's also you know a way to really reintroduce micro um, micro scaled um, extremely fine grained mixing of, of economic production as well as dwelling, um, which has been artificially separated for too long. Thanks, Frank. Nathan, you have any thoughts on uh, accessory commercial uses? Sure. You know, it reminds me of John Nolan. Everything's, uh, you know, has a place, but everything must be in its place. Um, it's all about the context. It's a, it'd be a horrible idea if you tried to say we need to allow that anywhere, let's say, in our city, because then it's going to have unintended consequences, which will result in more exclusion of people. And that's essentially when, you know, you have to sort of look at development history and see what changed after World War II. One of the things was, you know, starting really robustly in the 70s, once you've got these homeowners associations that are sort of these private governments, you're going to create the incentive for everybody to create a private government, even if they don't have one, in order to handle the management issues. So that's why I would be very cautious about where you do it. You, you do it where there's actually uh, a benefit to the neighborhood where it can serve as an amenity. In other places, it's just gonna cause people to say, no, we wanna exclude everything because you know, uh, uh, doing neighborhood development is not just about the design, it's also about the management. You know, that's why I always, you know, when I go to communities, they wanna talk about alleys and they'll say alleys are bad. And I'll well, say, well, you know, what makes an alley bad to you? You know, and we 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 dig down to it, and ultimately it gets down to you know if they're willing to state their actual beliefs that um, the, some creep made too much noise down the street from them, you know, and guess what? They're in a place that doesn't have any homeowners association to clamp down on that sort of stuff, and the local government won't do anything to to keep the the noise down. So either you're going to be in a place where everybody's happy with noise, or you're going to have some person hating alleys. And then trying to fight against them. So I'm really big into not trying to fight nature, so to go with it. So that would be what I would do is I would go ahead and say, encourage it in some neighborhoods that would be open to it where it could serve as an amenity, and but don't try to enforce it uh, everywhere. And 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 use that small space as an area that um, can serve as a prototype of how it can work. Um, so that somebody doesn't, you know, it's sort of like when you do form-based codes and they say, okay, we're going to make all the buildings come all the way up to the street. Well, what if the street is a strode in a horrible, you know, multi-lane suburban arterial, then all those businesses are ruined by bringing all the buildings up. So it's, it, it's all about context to me. So I, I hear that, um, Nathan, you're taking the, the smart growth approach to accessory commercial units of let's put them in the places where they're the most location efficient and solve for um, that efficiency, maybe put them there in walkable areas, but, but not out in the HOA dominated suburbs where they're just gonna be a stick in the hornet's nest and maybe not provide that much benefit. Um, Camille, what's your take? Well, I'll start off by saying that I'm working in an accessory commercial unit, <laughs> um, working out of a, a home garage converted into an office that is pretty awesome. Um, and I see that, you know, with COVID, I think a lot of people are going to be wanting to work from home more, um, as that's just, you know, what we've been shifting to. Um, and um, I, I think that, uh, gosh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, I'm going to jump to someone else. I think the fact that you, I think the fact that you work in one is fantastic. Um, but and you're, I think we also rel related to what Nathan was saying. Um, you know, you're a professional office in a, so you're not, you know, you're not having a lot of customers coming and going and deliveries and um, trucks backing up and and parking in the street or the alley to to uh, drop things off. And you're probably not generating much smelly garbage. So so those kind, you know, the context um, to Nathan's point. Um, context matters um, but so does the, what we mean by commercial because um, there's um, there's working from home and also you're, you're in a multi-person person office but a lot of commercial offices or commercial businesses that would be home based 
are a little bit slightly more intensive than a um, what a you know typical home-based business. You know, it's not it's not just having a laptop um, on a desk in your um, in your hallway or your spare room, um, but they're also not full-blown um, retail uses or food and beverage uses that have customers and things like that. So I, you know, some of those some some things can happen in even in um, gated cul de sac -y kind of communities without um, raising the hackles of the neighbors necessarily, unless they're just um, uh, philosophically opposed to the idea of commercial economic activity in their neighborhood. But that's got a, uh, that, that um, is not the same, in the same category as having a, a real heavy duty commercial use. Right, I mean, so this is a really, this is a pretty low intensive uh, area, but we do have a couple of main streets that are just, you know, a couple blocks down and um, and we're in a, the Montevilla neighborhood, which is like an up and coming neighborhood. And, and we think that, you know, there are some businesses along the, the street that we live on and, and hope that, you know, if more, more homes, you know, converted uh, in garages into offices that this could become like a, a new commercial node in the neighborhood. Um, and sorry for my brain fart. <laughs> I remembered what I wanted to say earlier. Um, I was just gonna say that we're working with a client um, who we, we were designing um, a muse street so that uh, these units with garages faced onto like a tight pedestrian way. And the client encouraged us to, you know, pop those garages out and, and convert them into working spaces so that, you know, I just think it's pretty progressive that that um, you know people in suburban Colorado are beginning to think about how how to bring you know that that commercial uh, sense into into more residential um, areas to make you know the the community more active and vibrant. So I'm hearing that maybe there's a difference between a home office with a few employees in it. And the Irish pub that I want to open um, behind my house on the alley. Um, so, uh, so maybe, the, but then this opens up the question, you know, as new urbanists, we're, we're kind of fans of form based codes. But what I'm hearing is that when it comes to uh, accessory commercial units, maybe some kind of use regulations need to be in the mix. What do you guys think about that? Well, use restriction in, in which way? I'm, I'm not sure what I would see the benefit being and sorry if I cut someone off thinking or Nathan was going to say something okay I, I was just going to say <laughs> in in most places to get something like this adopted it's going to have to come with certain uh predictability about uh use so I would say be prepared to have that that the, the uses lined out um because otherwise people are going to have have concerns about what it could be. And then if the neighbors can't actively manage it and the local police aren't going to manage it for you, then um, it's going to be a disaster. So yeah, I, I would definitely expect uh, uh, without making a value judgment, I would expect and be prepared to have the uses lined out just as much as the form. There was a proposal that I remember Andres Duane mentioning years ago about ambient standards as, the, as opposed to use regulations. In other words, that you could um, basically uh, regulate the activities based on whether they emit noise, smells, fumes, vibrations, um, traffic, um, you know, foot, whether it's foot traffic or, or vehicular traffic, um, those kinds of things that are more measurable and enforceable than whether it's a, a particular kind of use or not. And also it doesn't fall into the trap of, um, if you look at any city's um, zoning list of, of uses, they probably have things like pool hall uh, or billiard, billiard lounge or video arcade, um, things that are, that are really not very relevant uses anymore. And they probably don't have, cover things like um, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries or um, cell phone repair stores. So uh, if you have ambient standards, uh, um, 
theoretically, that should be a, a, a more enforceable and clear um, standard that really gets at the heart of what people want regulated, which is um, what's emanating from that building as opposed to what's going on inside it. Yeah, and I'd like to add on to that, Garland, if you don't mind. Uh, Jim Peters is the guru of uh, the, the Re uh, Responsible Hospitality Institute. And that's essentially the organization that um, helps people with best practices manage uh, the nighttime economy, as is, is it's called, where a lot of cities now are adopting, because of Jim, things like uh, nighttime mayors of cities. And uh, the biggest issue isn't coming up with the ambient standards. The biggest issue is who's going to enforce you know, because if you set it up, just so you know, it gets very complex really quick. You can have a law on the books, but if nobody's there to enforce it, it's as good as not being on the books. And so I think that becomes the, uh, the ultimate challenge in any of this is the management of those spaces. Otherwise, you're going to end up just where we ended up, you know, 60 years ago. We started banning everything that caused a problem. And, uh, and, and that's where we need to be a little smarter about it. But the, yeah, these, it's easier uh, to those, regulate a use because it's a, it's a one-time decision as opposed to a, a nightly measurement with a sound. Exactly. Because when I had to manage a downtown, that, I thought it was pretty simple. We had, you know, we had all the standards and the cops like, I don't want to do this, you know, because then I've got to have my meter, my sound meter checked and I got to do this and I got to do. And, and they said, so we've got bigger things to fight. And so that's what the Responsible Hospitality Institute is. They create actually a, a shadow bureaucracy to deal with these things. But it's I'm just pointing out it's not easy at all. But it's a it's an interesting Good prospect. Good. Thanks. I can imagine like neighborhood groups also contributing to, you know, regulating or, you know, watching out for that. Like, we, you know, like our neighborhood has like a lot of uh, like uh, safety groups and um, like the business association uh, is forming groups to, you know, to focus on on safety and improve businesses. So I wonder if that's something that we like could be offloaded to residents if it was, you know, that's really wishful thinking. But yeah, you know, I just always feel like a lot of like the thr like thriving places like is stemmed from like community from community. You know, I think that's a really good point. And um, it reminds me of uh, in my neighborhood, just a, a block and a half from my house uh, at 30th and Alberta, uh, Alberta Street's uh, a thriving retail street in, in Portland, Oregon, and, uh, and a motorcycle bar opened up. And, you know, they're kind of a she she motorcycle bar, but their clientele do ride Harleys. And, and they, they started doing cookouts and there was a line, some people in the line weren't wearing masks. And so now the neighbors, including the neighboring businesses have started to complain about the noise from this new business. And so what happened was the Alberta Main Street, which is the business association staged an intervention where the neighboring two businesses, the pizzeria and the Irish bar had an intervention with the owner of the motorcycle bar and had a little sit down talking to welcome to the neighborhood. Here's the rules of engagement for doing business in Alberta Street. I haven't heard any complaints since then, um, but that doesn't mean they're not coming. But I, I think maybe that's a more productive model to have peers be part of the conversation and to have more of a uh, sort of a mediation type approach to these where it's the peer businesses. I don't know what the stick is in that relationship, but the carrot is don't you want to be friends with your neighbors if you're going to sign a 10 year lease to do business, you know, 10 feet away from them for, for the next decade. Um, so thank you. Um, I think this is adding some, some definite complexity to this issue. And, and that's ex exactly what we expect from the, uh, CNU uh, group is to think through these, these issues in a more deep way. So I'm going to toss out one more issue since we have a little bit of time left. Um, and this one is houseboat fourplexes. So, you know, in a time when we're facing a 10 foot sea level rise, and that means that the water is gonna be rising into what we think of as traditionally urban dry land areas. Do we need to be thinking more about developing on the water's edge in ways that are more resilient and that can float up with the tide? Um, and so 
house boat floor fourplexes is, is one response. It's a mixture of, uh, of missing middle and, and houseboats, which is something we, we haven't built a, a lot of new in this, in this country recently, but was rather popular um, in previous decades. But how do you even regulate a houseboat fourplex? What's that regulated by? The International Marine Code? Like the boat code? You know, it's like, what, what are the questions that we would need to think through around these? And, and are there any prototypes we could look to or emerging leaders? I don't, I don't know about the, um, I, I think that's going to be a, a different conversation in Seattle than it is in Florida, because the coastal areas in Florida, when the tide goes up, it goes in much faster than it goes um, up, <laughs> because the land is, the land is low, whereas where you have a steeper bank, um, it's, it's going up. So as, as it, you know, with coast, with sea level rise, you know, there's there's kind of a vague notion that the coastline moves. I don't think that's that happens as cleanly as as um, the diagrams that show, you know, two thirds of Florida inundated. Um, it doesn't just happen that you know now that Lakeland suddenly has beach frontage because you have all that shallow <laughs> land. It's just going to be soggy for a long time before it actually becomes ocean, and um, so I don't know how that functions in a, from a long-term standpoint as sea levels are increasing in a place like Florida where the land is is pretty. Cool. I don't know that it's a. I don't know how it functions as a solution to um, for for longer than a few years to changes in sea level. But that's a that's a question I have. I'm not saying it's it's that's a you know a, what the so context is really important because as the water rises, it does different things. Being water, depending on what it's 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 coming up against. Um, yeah, that's it's important to keep in mind that um, that West Coast uh, steep cliff situations uh, and change in topography are very different from the the flat coast uh, context of, of Florida and. And, and probably much of the Atlantic seaboard, right? Uh, Nathan, what are your thoughts on this? I love houseboats. So I'm all for the houseboat fourplex. So, but no, I don't, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any epiphanies or anything associated with it, but I, I believe in creative solutions to a lot of these things. I'm surprised there's not, you know, I grew up in, uh, I knew people who lived on houseboats and they thought it was a pretty cool lifestyle. And, uh, so, uh, you know, why not? You know, I, I like it. Fantastic. Camille, when do you think uh, we can expect a houseboat fourplex designed by a DPZ? I don't know. I mean, I'm surprised that no one has, you know, talked about this yet. I love it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready to put some sails on it and just go, <laughs> go off. <laughs> um, no, but I, I think that, I think we should be looking at technologies that are, you know, advancing you know, houseboats and, and, you know, as something that I think that we should be talking about because, you know, who knows what, you know, places like Miami, what, what types of solutions they're going to be coming up with, you know, 20, 30 years down the road. And that could, you know, definitely be, be something to start looking at. So uh, it's quite provocative, Garland. <laughs> And so this leads to my next uh, my next one, which is you know if you, you step out the front door of your houseboat fourplex into your your new floating community, and you're hungry. Um, can you have a floating food cart pod to go eat at? Is it is this a thing yet? Do we have do we have floating food cart pods already out there in the world? I'm just not hip to it. I'm pretty sure Asia has a lot of floating food markets. Ah, so I'm hearing that we need to ask this question in the international session. Okay, okay. Garland, it sounds like you already have your presentation ready to go. So don't wait for DPZ, just go do it. Camille? Oh, no, I, I, I just think it's great. I mean, I, I love that. I think the, you know, food trucks 
are like has a huge culture in Portland and you know I think that like city should you know take advantage of like you know the waterfronts and I would love to see you know something like that pop up here um so maybe we should we should be looking to Asia uh for precedent all righty uh I, I mean it. book some international travel here to go check out those precedents snap some photos eat some examples Frank what if what if instead of um floating fourplexes in water we float them in the seas of parking lots that we have Indeed, uh, plenty of opportunities for that. And that leads into my next question, which is, um, uh, you, you know, so um, when, when you're looking to sell product, right, you, and, and you're looking for something that's attached, um, a fee simple attached product is a townhome, right? But then under FHA, uh, Freddie Mac, um, you can get a mortgage for one to four units. So my question, this is just obviously leading to the logical conclusion of this, um, is a stacked townhome fourplex a thing? Is there any legal reason why you can't do that? Are there any examples of that having been done out there in the wild? You're saying one above each other side by side, so two over two? Uh, yeah, either way. Did you, so you're sitting on a single lot, single tax parcel, but you've got four units, but then you've got a common wall to the next tax lot on either side as in a, a normal townhome. But yeah, say it's a, a daylight basement, two stores and, uh, and uh, an attic uh, with, with dormers. So one, one per level. That gets, that's a legal question I'm not qualified to answer. I have, I have heard um, lawyers talk about air rights townhouses that are divided by a plane, um, one owner owns from that plane to the sky, the other owns from that plane to the center of the earth. So it's on, so you're taking a fee simple property and dividing it in half horizontally. Um, but as far as I know, you can only do that once. Um, so you couldn't stack multiples um, that way. But that's, you know, again, that's, that's a legal question. Uh, I, I see. So you're, you're saying it would have to be a condominium to create those four legal units or, um, or say maybe an owner wanted to live in one and rent out the other three, then it's just a question of tenure. Um, well, okay. so Garland, I think that that has actually been around for for a while. I, I think that one of our uh, one of DPC's projects in Lakeland um, uh, has some townhomes. So I, I can look into that and see if we have um, if we've done any more of those or or what. Sounds good. I look forward to, to hearing more follow up on that. All right, I'm going to um, take a left turn into urban street design strategies to close out the session with a question about career intersections, as in Leon. And, uh, and, and so this is something that's come up in the past. But my question is, um, you know, Howard Blackson's talked about um, uh, career intersections with the Blackson twist, um, whatever that might be. And, uh, and he's made a, pr a proposal for this in his neighborhood of, of San Diego. But do we have examples of this sort of uh, um, use of, uh, of uh, offset intersection to create plazas and public space here in America that you can point to already? Can you, can you, give, a, can you give a quick, um, a little bit, slightly more color on what a career, what a career intersection so I'm going to, uh, to, to attempt this and correct me if, if I get it wrong, but my understanding of a career intersection is it's, um, it's a three-way intersection where you tee off, there you go, that's it, and, um, and you tee off to create a plaza to one side of the intersection. And what, this is the, the, the career intersection with a blacks and twist. And what Howard's done here is he's taken a four-way intersection and he's twisted it to create two three-way intersections side by side to create public space on either side of those now offset intersections. Is that, am I basically getting the gist of it here? So this is Howard's proposal for his, his neighborhood in, in uh, San Diego. So Thank a you. career intersection would be similar to that, but with one leg cut off. 
Right. Presumably. So do we do this? I mean, Camille, is this something that you see um, built into DPC's plans are, are already? Is, is this already part of our design language that we're, we're putting out there in the world? Or is, or is this still one of those emerging ideas that's looking for its, its first prototype to be built in America? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I really like the way that the those spaces are formed, but I, I haven't seen like intersections coming together like that. Not in our work yet, anyways. There probably are places that are similar to that or getting at the same concept in new um, in new town plans. Uh, um, you know, it probably by you know they're, they're probably not too hard to find those precedents, but I think that it looks like the the suggestion there is that in an existing grid um, gridiron street network to introduce those kinds of intersections as a way to Europeanize it um, uh, to uh, to create that sort of wiggle in an intersection um, those that those those precedents I'm not sure of but I would I would have to call up Victor Dover um, or John Massingale to ask the uh, experts on on all, all things street. Sounds good. Well, maybe we can dive into that a little bit more at this year's Congress. Um, and with that, uh, we are at time. So I want to thank everyone for participating. This has been a fabulous uh, session of uh, On the Park Bench. Thank you, Garland, so much. I, 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 on behalf of CNU, I want to thank all of the panelists today for sort of giving us a taste of the conversations and the topics that folks are going to be talking, that these specific folks will be talking about uh, at CNU 29, and that we hope that uh, our, our members and our audience will register and participate as well at, at the Congress. Um, I also want to thank uh, the, the audience today for, for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this on the park bench. Uh, please remember that next week uh, we, have a great, we have a great webinar lined up. And, and one final time, I want to thank Camille Cortez, Frank Starkey, Nathan Norris, and I want to thank Garland Woodsong for moderating today. Thank you all for your insights, and everyone have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mallory. Thanks, Garland. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We'll go buy a houseboat. <laughs> <laughs>